class 9th environmental applications and today here we have come to an end to our chapter or the first unit that is basic ecology so lastly here we will be discussing two topics that is flow of energy and flow of nutrients and we'll see what's the difference between these two and then we'll be covering two important ecosystems on the earth that is deserts and wetlands so firstly we'll understand what's the main difference between flow of energy and flow of nutrients so in the previous videos you have already learned about the food chain and the food web right so in a food chain you have the producers and then you have the primary consumers the secondary consumers and the tertiary consumers right so producers are the main producers of food followed by the primary the secondary and the tertiary consumers and like this energy flows from one level to the other level so you have energy moving in one direction or from one level to the other it's never the reverse isn't it it it's not like you have the tertiary consumers and then you have the secondary consumers it's always the other way around that is firstly at the higher level you'll have the producers followed by the consumers so this process of flow of energy which is only in one direction is known as linear flow of energy okay as opposed to this we have something called as cyclic flow of nutrients or simply flow of nutrients so what happens here here there is energy exchange or nutrient exchange or transfer between the living and the non living components of the ecosystem that is between biotic and abiotic components of the ecosystem when we say abiotic it's water it's land or soil and the air so the energy or nutrients flow in a cyclic motion between these non living components and the living components like plants microorganisms animals humans etc so what happens here let's look at some examples okay first example is of cyclic flow of nutrients is nitrogen cycle now we know that the atmosphere is made up of different types of gases like nitrogen oxygen carbon dioxide and there are other inert gases like helium neon argon etc isn't it now nitrogen makes up about 78% of the earth's atmosphere but this nitrogen which is free flowing in the atmosphere cannot be directly utilized by living organisms say plants or animals so to convert this atmospheric nitrogen into usable form we have nitrogen fixing bacteria in the soil okay so this free flowing nitrogen is converted into usable form that is into nitrates nitrites into ammonia by this bacteria so once the conversion takes place this is readily absorbed by the plants or trees now humans or animals depend or feed on these plants and trees and this nitrogen enters into their bodies and they consume that energy once they die once these animals die the nitrogen again enters into the soil right so now again once it enters into the soil it cannot get directly dissipated into the atmosphere so again you have bacteria called dentrification bacteria which convert this nitrogen again into atmospheric nitrogen and like this the cycle gets completed so here you have firstly free flowing nitrogen in the atmosphere which is converted into nitrites and nitrates by nitrogen fixing bacteria the third step is this energy is absorbed these nutrients are absorbed by the plants animals feed on the plants they eventually die and the nitrogen enters the soil again from here certain dentrification bacteria convert the nitrogen again into atmospheric nitrogen and the cycle gets completed okay so like this nutrients flow in a cyclic motion into the ecosystem and that's why we call it or we refer to it as 
cyclic movement of nutrients. So this is one example. Another example is carbon cycle. Now there is carbon also present abundantly into the atmosphere. Plants during photosynthesis, they, they produce carbon, okay. Then this carbon is taken by animals when they feed on these plants or trees. When these animals die, that carbon again enters into the soil. From the soil, certain carbon is given out into the atmosphere and certain amount of carbon is left behind into the soil. So this carbon that is left behind eventually over the years gets converted into fossil fuels. We burn these fossil fuels and this carbon again enters into the atmosphere somehow. So here you have another cycle being completed. So same carbon will be utilized by the plant and it will go on. Like this, carbon will move in a cyclic motion into the atmosphere. Then we have the oxygen cycle. Again, a very important life-sustaining cycle, right? So plants give out oxygen and there is oxygen already into the air, into the atmosphere. This oxygen is taken in by animals, so other living organisms, they give out carbon dioxide and this carbon dioxide is absorbed by the plant. Like this, the oxygen cycle gets completed. So oxygen cycle and carbon cycle are somewhat interrelated, okay? But they are independent cycles. So like this, you have another cycle being completed. So yes, Organisms or living organisms require different types of nutrients for their survival, right? Nitrogen is required for growth and regeneration. Oxygen here is required for cell metabolism. Sulfur is required for our DNA. Calcium is required for our bones growth, isn't it? So like this, we need these nutrients for our survival and these nutrients are easily available in the atmosphere in the soil in the water bodies which is transferred into our bodies and again given back into this abiotic components so you have the whole cycle being completed okay so that's the main difference between flow of nutrients and flow of energy that occurs in the food chain then here you have the another cycle that is water cycle so what happens in the water cycle Water gets evaporated from oceans, from seas, from rivers, from lakes. This evaporated water condenses in the upper atmosphere. That is cloud formation occurs. Then it rains heavily. This rain gets infiltrated as underground water. Excess amount of water flows as runoff and meets the seas or ocean again. And the same water again gets evaporated. So here you have another cycle being completed that is water cycle. Alright, so now what are the main differences? To make it very easy to understand, here you have the main differences between flow of energy and flow of nutrients. So the first difference is flow of energy. As I said, it occurs in a linear form, in a linear fashion while the flow of nutrients is a cyclic process. Secondly, energy in a food chain is lost at every level. You have learned this previously, right? From the producers, the energy that goes to the primary consumer is less. Then again, it is even further less the energy which is derived by the secondary consumer. So the energy is lost at every, every level. In terms of nutrients, there is no loss of nutrients. Whatever was derived from the atmosphere or abiotic components is given back. Okay, Nothing is stored or kept behind. No nutrients are lost. Thirdly, the flow of energy, it begins from the sun. Isn't it? The plants derive the sun's energy. Then the photosynthesis occurs and that's how they produce their own food. That's how they survive. And that is why because of their survival, you have consumers dependent on them. So without the sun, the flow of energy cannot operate. But in terms of cyclic flow of nutrients, sun is not involved. 
here you have the biotic and abiotic components interacting with each other continuously then lastly the decrease the energy decreases from producers to consumers as i said previously and here there is no decrease at all so these are your main differences between both both the processes okay now we'll understand one of the largest ecosystems that operates on the earth that is the desert ecosystem and here i have a i have put a picture of sahara desert which is the largest desert on the earth which spans in about 11 countries okay now what happens in a desert ecosystem in a desert you know that there is the sandy expanse everywhere and a desert is marked by completely arid conditions annual rainfall is less than 50 cm that is very very scanty rainfall while the temperature changes are very very drastic daily as well as seasonally there are great temperature fluctuations during the day time because of the presence of the sand the desert gets heated up very very fast and the temperature remains quite high sometimes it can even cross 50 degrees celsius during the summer season at night land gives out all this heat energy readily in the form of terrestrial radiation so since the energy is given out the desert cools down also very fast at night time so during the day time you have very high temperatures at night time the temperature can fall as low as 1 degree celsius which is very very cold so deserts are marked by such conditions now how have plants and animals adapted themselves to such harsh and extreme conditions okay for instance desert plants are xerophytic in nature most of the plants almost 99% of the plants they don't have leaves right they only have spikes and thick stems in order to store water all right now why they have these spines why they have this fine spines in order to avoid evapotranspiration if transpiration occurs the water little water which is available will be readily given out into the atmosphere so this is their defense mechanism and their survival mechanism then plants very few plants will have deep roots in order to get access to the ground water but since ground water lies at very very great depths roots are scattered in large areas so whenever it rains whatever water seeps into the soil it can be absorbed quickly by the plants and that is why roots are widely spread and many roots have tubes and bulbs in order to store water all right then another mechanism to adapt is the vexy coating or the cuticle which the leaves have developed on their surface okay so you you must have seen something like this that happens to plants so that is nothing but the thin coating which prevents loss of water okay now how have animals adapted to the desert like conditions okay you must have seen scorpions and different types of spiders living in the desert and look at their legs their legs are very very long and they are raised high above the ground right so the legs are raised high above the ground so that they can tread easily on the hot surface on the hot sand and that is why this is again their adaptation method then camel is another organism so now how camel has adapted itself it has developed a very thick skin okay it has very very long legs in order to walk into the sand and the feet have very thick pads so it becomes very easy to walk on the sand then uh, camels also have this huge hump so in this hump there is huge amount of fat which gets converted into water whenever required so you see how beautifully these desert animals have adapted themselves and then they have thick eyelashes and eyebrows so that they can prevent sand from entering into their eyes 
कि सिंस विंड गेट्स वेरी वेरी हाई स्पीड इनटू द डेजर्ट दिस इज हाउ दे हैव ग्रोन देम सेल्स सो दिस इज अ पिक्चर शोइंग कलेक्टिवली डिफरेंट टाइप्स ऑफ ऑर्गेनिजम्स दैट आर फाउंड इन अ डेजर्ट सो यू विल फाइंड सर्टेन टाइप्स ऑफ आउल्स वल्चर्स आर वेरी कॉमन देयर आर डिफरेंट टाइप्स ऑफ हॉक्स फाउंड देयर सर्टेन टाइप्स ऑफ डियर्स different types of snakes and insects are found there which can survive in those harsh conditions another important ecosystem on the earth is the wetlands so you must have come across a puddle of water somewhere around the fields and we call them wetlands so wetland is a place where the underground water table is very high and that's why the water starts overflowing and those are the areas which are very very important to the environment and we refer to them as wetlands now there are different types of wetlands the first type is a marsh a marsh is a type of wetland where the water is there okay in large quantities overflowing from the underground water table and here you'll find only reeds and grasses everywhere here you won't find any trees at times there'll be some stunted short bushes or shrubs that's it so a marsh here is marked only by grasses okay and there's a difference between so here's another picture of marsh then we have something called as a swamp so there's a difference between marsh and a swamp a swamp is marked by again stagnant overflowing water but here you'll have many huge woody trees okay wooded trees you'll find them in the swamps so this is one type of wetland that is marsh and swamp now here's another picture then we have something called as bogs and fens these are found mostly in the colder regions only marshes and swamps are found in the warmer parts of the earth while bogs and fens are another type of wetlands which are found in colder regions so here's just an example of how or what is the difference between bogs and fens now bogs are again wetland which you can compare to a clogged bathtub okay wherein the bathtub or the drain is clogged and the water doesn't drain out so that's what a bog looks like so it has stagnant water in it and you'll have many moss growing on the surface of water so eventually when this moss dies it gets settled at the bottom of the wetland that is at the bottom of the bog and it seals its bottom all right so eventually this decaying moss gets converted into peat p e a t peat is the is the first stage of coal formation okay so it gets converted into peat so as there are many mosses growing and dying the water slowly becomes acidic in a bog so what's a fan then a fan is like a drain or a bath tub which has a drain open so when you open the drain water gets easily flushed out so that's how a fan setup is okay so it's pro, it pro, it gets its water from the underground and it will have many grasses growing in it and in this region there is mostly limestone present in the soil so limestone kind of keeps the soil or the water in its pure form okay the water is kind of alkaline in nature in a bog the water is acidic in nature while in a fan the water is alkaline in nature and since the fans are not clogged there is free movement of water and that's why the water remains clear while here the water becomes stained brown color then we have the third type of wetlands which are found only in the tropical parts of the world and we know them very well they are mangroves in goa we find many mangroves along the coastal areas along the estuaries where the river meets the sea right so mangroves are very very important for our survival and the survival of the ecosystem okay so what do they do they have the capacity to absorb all the pollutants from the air 
and completely destroy them. They can protect the coastal areas from floods and from storms as well as from tsunamis. Okay, then they are like sponges. They absorb a huge amount of water when there is rainfall. They also act like infiltrators of water. Since water gets collected around the mangroves, they recharge the groundwater. So from the ecosystem point of view, from the environmental point of views, mangroves are very, very important. Okay, now how mangroves have adapted themselves along the coastal areas where the water is saline and sometimes the water is also brackish. Brackish water is a combination of fresh water and salt water. Okay, now how do they adapt? So they have they have derived viviparity. So what's viviparity? The seeds grow on the plant. The seeds germinate on the mangrove plant itself. Then they fall on the ground and they grow into a plant. So the seed here doesn't germinate independently into the soil. It germinates on the plant itself, then enters the soil and gets converted into a tree. Then they have pneumatophores. The roots, they protrude out of the soil. Okay, they protrude out of the soil so that they can derive atmospheric oxygen. Okay, so these are called pneumatophores. Another way of adopting in the salty conditions, marshy conditions. Then you'll find different types of organisms living in the mangrove regions. So this is a peculiar type of fish which you'll find around the mangroves. They are known as mud skippers. So this kind of fish, it can live underwater and it can also survive on the surface. And you'll find them only around the mangroves. Then, this is a type of fiddler crab which again thrives in the mangrove region. This is a hermit crab you'll find in the mangroves again. So you see it supports different, it supports different types of organisms. Then different venomous snakes live on the mangrove plant as well as around its roots in the water which are very fast moving and highly venomous in nature. Then there are different types of migratory birds also surviving on mangroves. Okay, you have many Siberian cranes and different types of goose or geese visiting these areas. Okay, so this is all about in the last unit that is the basic.